The following podcast is part of the MindBodySpirit.fm podcast network. What does it mean to be present, to try and stay in the moment that you're in and not worry about the future or regret the past? It's something I've been trying to do for a long time. I'm Diane Ray, and I have always had questions about the big picture. God, life after death, spirituality, metaphysics, and what drives people to do what they do. And I like to ask them about it and learn from it. If you're a seeker like me, I hope you join me for some of these conversations on the podcast and be present with me in this moment. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the podcast today. So as usual, I'm going to launch into just a little bit of an intro and a little bit of a story to get to our guest today. So I'm going to start off the show today by taking a short visit to one of my favorite book series that I read in high school, and it was called The Earth's Children Series by Jean M. All. And it started with the book The Clan of the Cave Bear. And this was originally published in 1980, and it was made into a terrible movie with Daryl Hannah that was awful and just did not give the book justice. But the books are amazing. And so the main character was called Ayla, And she was a Cro-Magdon child that was taken in by a tribe of Neanderthals. And as she was growing up, she learned plant medicine from her adopted mother. And she memorized all of the plant healing healing properties. And this is kind of a theme that goes through all of the books in the series. There's six books. And she becomes this incredible healer and, and spiritual leader for her whole tribe. But it all started back then in the beginning where she was learning all these plant healing properties. So it was explained in the book that the Neanderthals survived with this information because they had it in their cell memory, and that was passed on from generation to generation. And that's how they knew to eat one mushroom instead of another. But because Ayla was not Neanderthal, she had to remember all of this herself. And I was just fascinated by the idea of learning how to heal from plants from way back in 1980, wishing I could have the memory of an Ayla. And so since then, I've always been interested in plant medicine. And so fast forward to today, and there's a lot of renewed research into plant medicine, like, you know, there's ayahuasca psilocybin therapy, which is really interesting. And people are taking a new look at the efficacy of plant medicine for things like depression and PTSD. And today, we're not going to go down the mushroom road. (laughs) Unfortunately, that might be another show, but we are going to explore the work of flower therapy and specifically the Bach flower remedies. Now, before you say to yourself, oh, this is just pseudoscience and this, this, this isn't going to work, just have an open mind and we're going to learn something and hear a different view. So my guest today is Dina Salisi and she has overcome childhood therapy, depression, and other, uh, you know, emotional uh, things, you know, emotional maladies, I guess, and overcoming chronic, chronic pain by connecting to nature and Bach flower remedies. And she's a healer and educator with skills as a national board health and wellness coach, a certified hypnotherapist, and a Bach Foundation registered practitioner. So we're going to talk about her new book, The Art of Flower Therapy, and explore how to integrate this into our lives and learn about plant medicine. So welcome to the show, Dina. Hi, Diane. It is great to be here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me and diving into this, because I do think it's so fascinating to learn from plants and to really heal from plant medicine and plant therapy. And I'm sure you get skepticism, you know, from people from time to time when you tell them what, you know, what do I do? Oh, I'm a a Bach flower therapist. I'm sure some eyebrows go up and they don't believe that it really can work. So what do you say to them kind of, you know, you're at the cocktail party and then someone is asking you about this and they, they're they curious and they really want to know, how do you explain flower therapy and how it works? Yeah. So I always um, bring the conversation back around to nature and just that nature is the one universal source uh, that nourishes every living being on the planet. So to me, it like makes perfect sense that flowers would hold a vibrational energy that we could use for emotional well-being. And so um, I'm like very matter of fact about it. You know, like it's not magic. And that's the truth is that it might be magical. And I mean, just flowers themselves, I mean, are so beautiful and they're magical in their prolificness, right? Like um, birds and bees and bugs pollinate them. I mean, that in and of itself is 
scientific fact, but it's also mysterious and magical, right? But it isn't magic. So I think that's what I bring um, the conversation around to is that it's perfectly logical that there's vibrational energy medicine. In fact, quantum physics really understands that and articulates that really well now. So honestly, I don't get as many skeptics, <laughs> you know, and maybe it's the circles I run in, but I don't tend to get a lot of skeptics. And even people who um, are really practical people, I think once I break it down for them in that way, they they agree right away that, that you know, there's a felt sense to the vibrational nature of flower medicine, right? It makes sense to me, and especially the energetic part, because I always feel better if I'm out in nature, if I take a walk or, you know, immerse myself in that. And I think even um, there's therapy called uh, energy bathing or something like that, no, or nature bathing. I, uh, I forget. It's a, yeah, it's called forest bathing. Forest, that's I, I don't want to mess up the Japanese word for it. So <laughs> I'm not going to say it. It's shunrun something. But anyway, it's an ancient practice. And, um, you know, again, Japan, like when we look toward their ancient practices rooted in Buddhism and really reverence for the earth. Um, you know, they have just forests of wildflowers. You know, they have hydrangea forests. It's like someday I want to go there and experience that. But they recognize that just the energy alone of being in the forest is enough to hold us and really change our emotional states. And I work as a health coach and um, it's a very practical thing, you know, health coaching. I talk with people about like what's not working and what practices they can do that help their their emotional state. And when I ask people, you know, what makes you feel better? You know, what sorts of things make you feel better? Nine times out of 10, they say nature, just going outside or tending even to the potted plants in the kitchen, really. And I mean, I know this, like I'm a writer and I sit at my desk a lot. I take breaks. I just putter around my yard and um, I instantly feel better or my mind feels more relaxed. So there is a lot of good wisdom and truth in that experience. Absolutely. It makes such a difference if I just take a break or take a walk or immerse myself in that kind of environment. And there's a, a place here in Southern California, the flower fields in Carlsbad. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or been there, but uh, in the springtime every year, no, you should. It's amazing. And they have these flower fields uh -huh. and, you know, just walking around in them is, is pretty incredible. And so you can really feel, and I'm a big believer in, in that. And what I noticed in the book as I was reading through the art of flower therapy, that when you're working with someone, that's kind of the first thing that you talk about. How does it make you feel, right? And a lot of times Western medicine will bypass that for the pharmaceutical version or take the pill for this or something like that. Like really tying into how we're feeling is important, and especially with this therapy, right, with flower therapy. Well, I believe that that's the foundation for all healing, right? Because if we've all had the experience, if we're in a negative state of mind, um, if our physical challenges are weighing so heavy on us that we can't see a way out of it, it's really hard to turn that bend toward healing, right? So, um, and again, science knows this now that, uh, it, you know, I mean, we have great books, um, the Gabor Mate book, The Body Keeps the Score, right? We all know that if if we're suffering um, emotionally, that it's really, really difficult to heal physically. And oftentimes, like, you know, what Western medicine wants to offer us is a pharmaceutical or an operation. And I think many of us have had the experience, too, where we can use that therapy and we might start to get better on one level, but it comes back if we're not healing at the root, right? Right. That's so true. I mean, the emotional uh, ties to physical healing, like you said, I think are undeniable. And I'm, I'm thinking of just in my own I experience, in my own family, a, my, a brother, my brother-in-law who was going through a horrible divorce, and for years he had this jaw pain in his jaw. And then as he was getting out of this horrible situation, like miraculously, you know, the pain was was leaving. And I can only imagine that's like, you know, clenching and, and holding back what needed to be said, you know, causing that pain. And then, of course, you know, working with Louise Hay and affirmations and, and all of that in the past totally makes sense. And I wanted to touch a little bit on that, on affirmations, because 
you bring it up in the book and you and you use that a, as a way um, to heal working together. And this was in another another project that you did with the oracle cards. Yeah. But Bach, Dr. Bach, that you used the remedies, you know, the Bach flower remedies, didn't really talk about affirmations or didn't use those, but you right. found that it's really successful. Yeah, it is not traditional Bach method at all. <laughs> And that's okay. Um, it is more of a Louise Hay style, you know, positive mindset um, style of healing. And what I notice is, well, so, okay, so a couple of things. So I started when I developed the affirmations for each Bach flower when I was in Bach training and, um, you know, I was trying to remember them. And that's just kind of how my mind works is to kind of like accentuate the positive. So that really helped me. And then I started giving the affirmations to friends and then to clients and people were really blown away how that grounded them into what they were trying to do with their mind. And then as a health coach, as a national board health and wellness coach, you know, we're taught that what we're trying to do is to get people to change their perspective because that's recognized that when they change their mindset that then they can take on, maybe they have to do some work to heal and uh, maybe it's really daunting. So what um, when I began health coaching, before I started giving my clients um, flower essence remedies and the affirmations that went along with the remedies, I would design what was called a healing topic for them. And so we would talk about, you know, what, what do you want to change in your life? And it could be something like, you know, I want to get a better job. And so, you know, something so basic as that, but like I would have them sort of put it in an affirmative, like one line statement so that they could start to shift the negative mindset, right? And this was transformational in and of itself. And so that, you know, I was telling them that's a positive affirmation that you're taking on. You're seeing yourself in a different light. And it all begins with how we see ourselves and our capacity. And I want to tell people just a little bit about Dr. Bach, since you're a trained Bach therapist, you know, in that method. And he was, um, you know, uh, a visionary. I mean, back in the 1930s, Dr. Edward Bach, and he came up with the original 38 remedies that he identified. And as I was reading in your book a little bit about him, how he came to this really intuitively, like he really right. was an empath and he really felt these properties and these energies from these flowers. That I, yeah. I thought that was such, I, I could imagine him trying to explain this, you know, to his colleagues then, how, right. how it went well, over. <laughs> He was an intuitive and he was an empath and he was also a scientist. So he was a very balanced, you know, he was very balanced in that way. And so I think that even though, you know, some of his colleagues, you know, didn't believe in it, I do think that it was of the time, right? Like his contemporaries were like Carl Jung, Rudolf Steiner. I mean, these people who were really taking on this idea of this inner self and this higher power that we have, right? Exactly. I thought it was interesting in the book, the way he divides his remedies into seven categories of emotional challenges that he identified back in the 1930s are, are really probably will, will never change for millennia, right? I mean, right. and I, I, I'm just going to touch on the seven because I think it's so interesting how they apply to today. Yeah. You know, there's fear. Well, how can we be any more fearful than we are right now, you know, with what's happening in our world yeah. With you know wars, you know, I, I'm I have stress just getting up in the morning thinking about right. that fear, uncertainty, not sufficient interest in present circumstances. I thought that one was really interesting, and how he identified that in 1930 just seems so so present of today. Yeah, you know, so relevant. Yeah, it's so relevant to today. Loneliness. I mean, I've been reading loneliness is the new epidemic right now that's causing all kinds of problems, all kinds of sickness with people. Oversensitive to influence and ideas. Well, we're bombarded with influence and ideas 24-7. We can't escape it even more so now than he was in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, despair, that's <laughs> always going to be in, in the in the worldview. And overcare for welfare of others. I thought that was interesting and also so relevant to today. Because so many people are caring for loved ones. You know, there's the sandwich generation that's caring for older parents. And I just, I thought that it was so, um, you know, so key that he came up with those specific seven. 
I agree. And I love the organization of it. Like I, I'm an organization freak, so that really appeals to me. And so when I teach um, classes on flower therapy, I'll teach it based on the categories. So we'll do one category each time. And I do it, this is his specific order that I roll it out in. So like fear is his first category. And like you're saying, like who can't relate to fear, right? And so it is so perfect. Like it's such a great entree and there's, you know, there's five fear flowers. So I can start students off right away with just look at these five flowers and how do they relate to you right now? How have they related to you in the past? And, you know, it is a brilliant system. And he's got these 38 different flowers and each one of them within the categories breaks down even more deeply into the way fear shows up or the way over care or sensitivity shows up. And being human beings on planet Earth, we can each relate to all of these states. We don't have them all at once, but we've all experienced them. So it is, it's a beautiful system of just emotional, um, you know, the emotions of humanity. It is. And I, I think it's interesting how he laid it out in this certain way with fear being, I think, the root of everything, right? right? There, There's a great movie, one of my favorites from like the 1990s called Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No. it it's a great movie. I won't bore you with all the details, but he he dies and he goes to the afterlife and he has to defend his life. And they're telling him, the one thing that stopped you from everything in your life is fear. Mm. And, and it's so true because it's if you get down to the root of things, that is kind of the basis of everything, right? What keeps us from relationships, from going for that job. And it's, it's, it's fear Absolutely. on different levels, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. So there's um, a lot of philosophers um, believe that there's only three negative emotions, and those are fear, anger, and sorrow, and that every other emotion, you know, negative emotion, can fall into those categories. So yeah, I mean, and fear is so present, so much a part of it. It is. And what might surprise people when they're kind of looking into flower essences, and what can it be used for that people might say, oh, I never... I never thought that would work. Well, I mean, honestly, I think I've used them for any <laughs> anything that somebody has experienced that they're having trouble with. So that's the thing is like, um, okay, so for instance, the walnut flower is useful in times of change when someone is having difficulty adapting to change, but not everybody has difficulty adapting to change. So it, right. So it's it's very that's what I love the most about it is that it's truly holistic in that it recognizes that everybody experiences challenges differently. Right. Right. I have one friend that is specifically very afraid of change. Yeah. Like she won't let <laughs> she won't make a change. She'll let it happen to her. Like right. she'll she would rather react and wait to be fired from that horrible job than leave. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, walnut would be perfect for her because it would help her to change. But also walnut, you know, has this like boundary, right? Like a walnut shell that it creates this emotional boundary. So obviously her energetic boundary is what we call porous, right? That she's letting in other people's emotions and kind of taking, making that take center stage. So yeah, walnut flower would help to usher her into that with more ease. And the book really lays out um, very... Uh, very clearly, I mean, someone could pick it up and really start making their own essences if they wanted to, pretty simply. Yeah, that's the idea, is that it's completely comprehensive and really um, it contains everything. It even tells you where you can buy the remedies to mix them and all that kind of thing. And then I'm also a firm believer in, you know, just the power of nature in that if you wanted to, say, work with the flowers just in person, like, if you were having a lot of overthinking and you lived nearby the white chestnut tree, which is very prolific throughout the United States, you know, I've had personal experiences where you just go and you be present with the plant. And that really can do a lot, you know, to, to get you on the road, for sure. Yeah. I like, I mean, I well, I did look for my favorite flower and it. it's not it's not in a remedy, unfortunately, mm -hmm. which is a gardenia. But I'm very sensitive to scents and smells. And, and when I smell a gardenia, I get a lot of uh, of memory from that, and also I find it very calming. And also plumeria, which was yeah. something that I didn't grow up with, but is here in, in Southern California. There there weren't a lot of plumeria 
in in Florida. I don't know why. I would think it would be kind of a similar climate. Um, but I mean, does aromatherapy come into your your practice as well? Well, I mean, I believe that anything that relates to our senses is can be utilized and also, you know, can affect us for the worse, right? Like if we're in a live near a garbage dump, you know, that right. really, I mean, really, that doesn't contribute to our well-being. So I believe in all of it. I personally don't really um, use essential oils in my healing practice. Like I love them for myself, but that's not what I use with others. But, you know, honestly, there are now it's it's funny because so Dr. Bach started this um, revolution in the 30s and he started out with 38 remedies. Well, now there's like I, I mean, I want to say 600 plus um, flower essence remedy, um, not practitioners, but developers worldwide. So there's tons of companies and I know there's the Hawaiian essences. And so they do plumeria and all those tropical flowers. So, um, you know, I'm not familiar with all of them, but I'm familiar with some of the newer ones too. And um, they all, I mean, they all work on some level because they all come from the energy of the flowers. So when we're using the subtle energy of plants, you know, plant medicine, it works. It, it touches us at the core. And it's so specific and, and personal and, and individual. And I'm, I'm a big fan of giving people any uh, you know, armor, like any anything that they can use in their healing journey that's going to help, you know, along with, you know, working with your doctor, of course, you know, y- using Western medicine, what you're comfortable with. But I like having all these other tools that can just help us along and, and help our healing journey be a little bit easier. I mean, have you seen some success with, you know, people with chemotherapy and things like that, where they use the essences as well? In, in connection with whatever their treatment is? 100%. I mean, I would say, if not more than half of my clients are also using Western medicine. Because when you want to get well, you know, you use <laughs> what you have to use. And I have worked with several um, cancer patients who are going through cancer therapy. And what the flowers provided them with was a strong foundation. Again, that fear, right? Like there's so much fear around having to go in and get the therapy done. I mean, it's it's scary. And um, so it would really help them to feel not scared and confident. And really, you know, what I notice is they heal at a quicker rate, for sure. It definitely must support that, you know, support your emotional state. And there was another interesting thing in the book that I wanted to ask you about where you talk about flower remedies for common emotional states as well as physical remedies. Like you can use it topically, you know, for your skin or for your hair and things like that. But you can also use it for if you're upset about your hair loss emotionally, you know, or about regrets from the past or things like that. And I thought that that was so interesting to use in that way. Yeah, I think that's really interesting too. And I'm actually seeing more and more um, makers of like skincare and shampoo and body care put flower essence remedies in, you know, their formulas. I see that a lot now. And um, like, for instance, when I was perimenopausal, you know, you get the hair loss and your skin starts to change. And so I would add the, you know, corresponding remedies of what I was feeling emotionally, I would add to my shampoo bottle or add to my skin spray. And, um, you know, if not for anything else, I think that it definitely provided more of a sense of comfort and nourishment. And um, yeah, so it feels really good. Yeah, any extra support, I'm I'm all for that. We need it, especially with what we're going through these days. I mean, you must have, of all the people that you've worked with, do you have a favorite healing story of working with someone with remedies that was just so dramatic? I mean, I really love everyone, <laughs> all of my students and clients, because they open themselves to me. So it is a deep, you know, there's a deep bond there. Um, One of my very first coaching clients, um, like I think she was my practice client, like way back when I started health coaching, and I asked her if I could recommend her remedies alongside the coaching, and and she allowed me to do that. And she was a pretty mainstream person, like she had never had any holistic therapies before, but she was suffering from um, MS, and she couldn't get out of bed most days out of the week, and she became severely depressed, and um, We only worked together four months, but by the end of it, she was up out of bed. She was doing volunteer work. She was getting her life back. And what she recognized was that um, she was really depressed, mostly because 
she had lost her job and she was in a managerial position and she felt like she had no control over her life. And that's when the MS popped up. And so we really kind of related that to like her lack of physical control. And by the end of it, really mostly working with the remedies and kind of like, you know, helping her, like I never gave her any um, any medical advice, right? She had a doctor and, and she had her medication. I never talked to her about medical stuff. You know, we went over her bio markers occasionally, but really it was the change in her mindset that came about through the flowers where she was able to relax and release control. That was a big part of what we worked on. And her body started to relax and uh, her MS didn't want her person to go away. But one of the things she did is she began to work um, on as a volunteer for the MS Foundation. And she started organizing groups. And it was just like she started using it like for good. And it was so empowering. And like, it just makes my heart swell even to think. That's so great. What an amazing, you know, supplement. And to see someone react like that, it must make you feel really good. Yeah, for sure. To have that, have that experience. So I want to tell people some fun, exciting news that if they're interested in this kind of thing and in, in plant healing and plant therapies, that you're launching your own podcast, which I'm happy to say will be hosted on mindbodyspirit.fm, called Your Healing Garden. And this is going to launch in January 2024. So what can people expect to hear on the podcast and things they can learn and how we're going to get them excited that you're yeah. coming on board? <laughs> I am I am so excited about this podcast. I have to let you know. I put a lot of thought into it beforehand. And I wasn't sure how I was going to do it because um, I I really, you know, I wanted it to focus on nature. And I was like, well, I don't want to do it over Zoom because it's focused on nature. And although I could get some good conversations, I just was feeling called to do something different. So I took on this monumental task of doing the interviews in person in people's, either in their garden or in a nature um, sanctuary of their choice. And so it's um, your healing garden cultivate well-being with the energies of nature. So the focus is that I'm working, I'm, I'm interviewing all sorts of people, healers, botanists, teachers, um, artists, nutritionists, anyone who works with an element of nature. And I'm really trying to highlight that, that love of nature that we all possess and sort of inspire people with these different visions of what each person is doing. And I already started doing the interviews. It'll launch on January 11th, but I began interviewing. And it's already like um, just got me super excited. And I have some really amazing guests. I have artists, botanists. I have a couple who I'm interviewing who do tea ceremony. And I was just like, well, how great is that? Because with the tea, we have the herbs, the water, the fire. And so there's just so much um, rich, deep conversations that we're having, and it's sparking my awareness more. And so I just want to spark everyone's awareness about how not only nature holds us and heals us, but how it's so easily accessible, and we're already doing it. And so I just want everyone to become more aware of it. And um, I really believe that that's the foundation of planetary healing, because if we're in tune with nature and we're really taking care of the earth from that love and that reverence, then we can't do destruction. We can't. It wouldn't be possible. So that's my focus. Well, I think it's going to be amazing. And I think people are going to love this. And you have so much great information to share. So I'm excited to be able to present this to all of the podcast listeners out there. And I want people to find you. And you're on you know, Facebook, Instagram, the usual places. And I guess the best place to reach you would be your website, and that's Dina, S-A-A-L-I-S-I dot com, Dina Salisi dot com. Would that be the best entry point for people? Absolutely. You can do everything there, and I have tons of articles and information, and you can reach me if you want to have a complimentary phone call about a healing session. I also do um, in-person wellness sessions, and I, I've been doing full moon and new moon healing circles in the Napa Valley, so I got a lot going on. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like an incredible experience. Is there wine with that? I'm just curious or no. I mean, you're in Napa. <laughs> there's not. It's, you know, there's some cookies sometimes and tea. But um, yeah, we try to keep it focused on nature. But you can always like, go out wine tasting afterward. There's a great wine bar right across the street. So Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect location. Well, thanks so much for sharing all of this. And I hope that everybody makes a note that the podcast will be launching January 11th, Your Healing Garden. 
with Dean Salisi. And thanks for listening to this podcast. I appreciate every single listener. If you like what you heard, please leave a review. And if you haven't downloaded the free mindbodyspirit.fm mobile app, make sure you do that in the App Store and you can get that for Apple or Android. And you can also leave a message or comment for any of our podcasters on the open mic feature. So check that out and make sure you give a listen to all of the amazing podcasters we have on the mindbodyspirit.fm podcast network. And thanks for joining me, Dina. Thanks, Diane. Victoria Moran. Since we launched the Main Street Vegan podcast back in 2012, lots more people have discovered the way that moving in a vegan direction can infuse our lives with vitality, spirituality, and compassion. My guests are experts on every aspect of making this work in your real life and our real world. Join us for Main Street Vegan here on mindbodyspirit.fm.